Still, inflation expectations in the market are rising, and that is the bulk of the rise in interest rates. Uh, what you're looking at here on the top in red, that is consumer expectations for inflation in the long run, and that is still drifting slowly downward. In blue, that's the bond market's expectations for long-run inflation, and the turning point was not the election. The turning point was in May when OPEC decided they were going to do something about these very low oil prices. And um, it was the possibility that global supply and demand for oil would come back into balance that convinced bond investors that no, inflation's not going to be one to one and a half percent forever. Uh, it is actually going to be closer to two percent eventually. Uh, that blue down there is a little con confusing because it's sort of inverted, but it's just it's the difference between the two lines. And what you can see is that right now, uh, compared again to May, uh, we, we've got a little inflation premium built in. Um, in addition to that, it's quite a bit more inflation expectations than there were several years ago. The Fed view on inflation is divided into two things. The things they believe they can control, and that would be uh, how much labor slack there is. It uh, would be uh, what people think inflation is going to be long run, so inflation expectations. And these, in their mind, are the, the sort of medium to long run determinants. It is what they make policy to control. Uh, the things the Fed thinks are uh, transitory or exogenous, that is, outside their control, include productivity and uh, oil, the dollar, and global demand. So let's start with a look at some of those. Productivity growth tends to be extraordinarily volatile. So in any given quarter, uh, you know, it can jump, it can dive. But the longer run trend, which is up there in that red line, that's a centered five-year average. Uh, that longer run trend has been falling since uh, 2000. So for 17 years, productivity has been slowing. There is an enormous amount of debate among economists about what drives productivity changes. Uh, it is noteworthy that many of us, myself included, believe that regulation has something to do with it. Uh, but if you ask Janet Yellen, particularly about financial market regulation, she'll tell you it's good for growth because it removes uncertainty. I would just point out that, uh, to, to pick on another bank, uh, Citibank, since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act, Citibank now has 3,000 plus people working in its compliance department. So these are 3,000 or more earning six figures, probably close to mid six figures, and they don't produce anything. There's no output. Their job is simply to comply with the rules and make sure everybody else is complying with the rules. As a good friend said, uh, boy, if I was running Citibank, I think I'd ask, what do you think we could do with, say, 1,500 compliance people? But anyway, uh, there is a cost. And uh, I have seen work, for example, Morgan Stanley did work where they calculated productivity taking the banks out, and uh, lo and behold, productivity is still growing 2%. So in fact, you could argue that the decline in the last 10 years is entirely due to regulation. The OECD just published a terrific paper, too, though, where they said that um, zombie companies are an issue as well. So what is a, a zombie company? Well, the idea is you have an industry that collapses. 
is inefficient. Maybe it's because you had a demand shock like the Great Recession, the financial crisis, and you don't let that industry die. You keep it going. A terrific example of that is coal mining and steel production in China. Together, they employ uh, the biggest steel company in China has 300,000 employees, but between the entire coal and steel industry, they employ uh, several million Chinese. China produces enough steel in the year to meet global demand, and then another 10% on top of that. You might call that excess capacity. It is enormously inefficient, and they are propped up with below market loans. Uh, there were steel companies, some of them have been closed for three years. The government has instructed the banks to extend credit to continue to pay the employees at those companies, so they do. Uh, <clears throat> these zombie companies prevent more efficient competitors from rising up, not just in China, but in the U.S., in Europe, in Japan. And as a result of this, and uh, zombie banks in Europe and in Japan and so forth, uh, the OECD thinks that productivity growth and therefore potential GDP growth globally is half a percent lower than it should be. This is a real problem. And it's one of the reasons that while I am a uh, big believer in globalism, I am a big believer in free trade I'm starting to question whether we need to be tougher. And uh, I do think that while this has become a very politicized issue, it's important to remember that uh, the Obama administration recognized this problem too. And they put enormous tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum where uh, China is practicing the most egregious uh, violations of global trade rules. The U.S. dollar is the strongest in 14 years, so this is also something out of the Fed's control. <coughs> Janet Yellen, I forgot to mention, but when we were looking at productivity in a speech in Stanford, she said that as long as productivity growth is low, interest rates will be on the low side. That's one reason to keep them low. This is another one. Uh, when the dollar is high, it makes it more difficult to compete with foreign producers. So foreign-made goods are cheaper when they come into the U.S. U.S.-made goods are more expensive when we try to sell them overseas. And that's because if you think about selling in London, for example, those folks in London have to change their pounds for dollars before they can buy the goods. And they're not going to get as many dollars when the dollar is strong. The dollar is strong partly because of expectations for faster growth, and you might think as the realization seeps in that Trump can't do everything he wants, that the dollar would weaken in response to that. But the dollar is also stronger because the Fed is raising rates and every other global central bank is cutting them, almost. And as a result, there are fewer dollars in circulation. There are more euros, more yuan, more British pounds. And that also makes the dollar more precious. It's going to drive it up in value. I think the dollar will continue to strengthen this year. So now let's turn to the things the Fed thinks it does control. The first one is labor market slack. They think the unemployment rate is close to full employment. That is, even though there are still 4.7% of the labor force looking for work, unemployed. Uh, they believe that is consistent with frictional unemployment, that you need to have some people out to keep wages from accelerating uncontrollably. Uh, they'd like to stabilize the unemployment rate at about 5%. Now, the way you achieve that is either by slowing job growth, that's the red line up there, or by accelerating labor force growth. That's the blue line up there. And as you can see, job growth has been slowing for two years. Labor force growth has been accelerating for four years. Um, in the last year, they're both growing about 2%. That's what you want. You want them in balance. 
Unfortunately, the Fed has no faith that the labor force can continue to grow. And I must say that uh, when we do have tight job markets, immigration is a key part of labor force growth. It is a safety valve the U.S. economy has that most economies around the world don't. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the last couple of days, immigration has been in the news. So that's something to keep an eye on. In the meantime, here's the unemployment rate. The uh, blue is, is national, the red is New York State. I wouldn't worry about that jump three months ago. The state numbers are always kind of volatile. That was probably one company that had some big layoffs, but the unemployment rate in New York is, is very much in line with the national average. That's actually kind of unusual going back historically in the 70s and 80s. We were higher in the 90s. We were higher and didn't come back into line until the latter part of the cycle. Same thing in the 2000s. Uh, seeing the New York State unemployment rate never reaching the peak levels the national rate did and coming down faster is a good sign. I think one of the things that's working very much in our favor right now is that uh, some of our neighbors, Connecticut and New Jersey, have raised taxes significantly. Their budgets are not in as good shape as New York, and um, we're really benefiting from that. You see that downstate, for those of us who uh, have friends who live in Fairfield County, for example, uh, the advantage of living there, the tax advantage has pretty much gone away. And the housing market in lower Fairfield County right now is one of the five worst in the entire United States. Uh, you know, things like relative tax rates make a really big difference and when you think about how much of New York's economic engine is in New York City, the fact that uh, it really makes sense financially to think about living in Brooklyn rather than thinking about living in, say, Westport, Connecticut, uh, that, that is a big advantage for our state, and it's a big advantage for our state's finances. Income growth in New York State is lagging a bit behind the national average. And, uh, you know, we'll see if that picks up. I, I would point out that you'll notice income growth has been slowing since 2014. Um, I, I would expect that's going to pick up. Now, part of what that is and I know what you're thinking. The economy is certainly a lot healthier than it was a few years ago. Why is income growth slowing? Well, it's, it's slowing because uh, a, a lot of income was coming up from zero at that time. We had much faster growth in employment a few years back because we were taking up the slack still from the Great Recession. So the slowdown doesn't bother me too much. And I would point out Notice how very much stronger income growth was in New York back in 12 and 13. And if you look at the level of income in New York State, uh, what we're doing is we're giving back a little bit of a positive gap that we opened up. And I would expect uh, that things continue to perform pretty well on the income front. Looking at interest rates, we have seen a significant rise in rates, about 70 basis points at the 10-year uh, in the last year or so, since May. Uh, Trump explains about a quarter of that. Uh, but in addition, you've got the fear of the end of uh, the, the Fed's quantitative easing reinvestment. The Fed has a $4.5 trillion balance sheet. Right now, they're maintaining the size of that as bonds mature, they reinvest. And uh, believe it or not, the biggest reaction when we went back and looked at the days when interest rates rose and what the big stories were, it was OPEC and oil. 
more than anything else. I am quite confident in my forecast that 10 year note yields, therefore, are not going to rise over the rest of this year. The Fed is going to raise rates, and that higher floor is a factor. But the fact that uh, Trump can't get economic growth to accelerate as much pe as people thought perhaps he might, uh, so that takes some of the inflation risk out of bonds. Uh, the fact that QE tapering is not going to have the big impact people expect, and that's primarily because, uh, thank goodness it wasn't me, it was my colleague who did an exhaustive look at that $4.5 trillion balance sheet and what's happened to it in the last few years. They are reinvesting, but they're not coming out of a coupon and going into the same one. The duration in that portfolio has plummeted in the last several years. Um, there are literally hundreds of billions fewer uh, notes in the 10-year bucket than there used to be. It is very short. And as a result, as stuff rolls off and gets replaced, I think the impact on yields will be considerably less than people feel it will be. In the meantime, I think it's important to realize that a lot of the fear in the bond market right now is based on the assumption that we are going to see fiscal stimulus and fiscal stimulus is inflationary. I would just remind you that we have had 10 years of massive monetary and fiscal stimulus around the world. Global growth, 2% this year, according to the IMF. Um, historically, that is extraordinarily weak. Demand globally is weak. Capacity, we've got excess capacity in one industry after another. And to some extent, inflation is very much a global phenomenon. That's going to hold things back. Okay, I'm going to apologize for this chart before I even start talking about it because there's so many things going on in it and it's rather complicated. But what we're looking at is the way the Fed makes policy decisions. Because if you think about it, the Fed funds rate is a number. Right now it's actually a range. It's from 50 basis points to 75 basis points. Why is it 50 to 75? Well, because the Fed thinks that's neutral. It's not going to encourage the kind of growth that will cause inflation to rise, but at the same time, it's not going to hurt growth enough to make inflation fall. Neutral. The thing is, to get to neutral, you have to know what the neutral rate is in the first place. And to do that, I'm going to zoom in here so you can see a little better what we're, what we're looking at. I'll start by drawing your attention to the green up there. That green first sitting on the zero line and then stepping up December of 15 to uh, 25 to 50 and stepping up again December of 16 to 50 to 75 basis points. That is the Fed's target range. The blue line and yeah, they, they, they really do make it this complicated. The blue line is what they call the neutral rate, which is real. So you have to add inflation back into it. I'm sorry, they call it the natural rate. You see, I'm doing it. I'm confusing myself. The natural rate is real. To get to a neutral rate, you have to add inflation back in. I did that with that red line. So after the financial crisis, a neutral interest rate would have been negative, deeply negative, which Europe actually did, and thank goodness we did not, because it would have just destroyed community banks. It would have wiped out their earnings. Uh, and community banks are essential to the U.S. economy. But the point is, it's rising back up towards zero now. 
Now, further complicating things. They have this neutral rate estimate, but it's based on data. And some of this data, loan growth, for example, credit activity, it's reported with a really long lag. We don't even know what happened in the fourth quarter. The last solid number we have is the third quarter. So I drew a dotted red line to represent their forecast. And you see what's going on in the forecast is that um, it takes off like a hockey stick. And that is the justification for the two rate hikes we have so far. Uh, the last actual real measured number we have is from the third quarter, and it was still negative. But they're assuming it's going to take off from here. Now, when they raised rates in 2015, they had a similar hockey stick forecast, and they were going to hit it within one quarter, which was the quarter they were in when they made the rate decision. So based on their logic, you know, it's only one quarter's forecast. When they raised rates, they were raising it to what they thought was neutral. Turns out they were wrong. So in the fourth quarter of 2016, they've got a similar hockey stick forecast. And again, in one quarter, they need to raise rates one more time. They raised them again. It may turn out they're wrong again. In that case, it's going to be difficult to raise rates three times this year. I have read, I don't know how many economists, writing that they should shine a spotlight on the March meeting at the meeting this Wednesday, indicating to the world they're ready to raise rates because GDP growth is stronger, because inflation is picking up a little bit. The data support a rate hike. Well, actually, no, they don't. Not the data the Fed actually looks at. That does not support a rate hike. One of my very favorite Fed officials is James Bullard. Bullard is the president of the St. Louis Fed, and one of the reasons I like him, he's been around for a long time, and he's actually willing to stand up and admit that he's wrong. That is one heck of a thing in a public official. Although, you know, when it's a public official who doesn't have to face the voters, maybe it's a little bit different, but still. Bullard came to the New York Forecasters Club two weeks ago, and he started his speech by saying, you know, I've been calling for rate hikes for five years. And I'm really glad we didn't do it. And I woke up the other day and I asked myself, why have I been wrong? Not just a little bit, but consistently, quarter after quarter after quarter for five years. <clears throat> And the reason is I'm trying to do this analysis the way everybody else does it at the Fed. Let's guess where the neutral rate is and raise the Fed funds to that level. So he said, here is the median forecast for the neutral rate from the Fed starting back in 2012. And you can see that hockey stick sliding down the line. Every quarter they're expecting uh, a sharp increase, and every quarter it's delayed. He has decided that he's going to wait and see. And I really wish the Fed would do that, too. Seriously. Uh, you know, when Janet Yellen was appointed as chair of the Fed, her very first speech was about income inequality. She called it the single biggest challenge facing policymakers today. So income growth, if you think about it, it comes from a, a, a multitude of sources. And if you look at the top quintile, a lot of that is going to be return on investment income. It's going to be rental income. And if you look at the bottom quintile or two, it's wages. That's it. You know, my, my, my broke friend doesn't have an equity portfolio. Go figure, right? I mean, it just makes sense. For 30 years, since the mid-1990s, when Alan Greenspan was the Fed chair, the Fed has had a policy to attack inflation preemptively. 
So what have they achieved with that? On the plus side, they've stabilized inflation expectations, right? Nobody's expecting inflation to take off. It's going to be 2% forever. They've also given us low and relatively stable interest rates. But on the minus side, wage inflation doesn't grow until the labor market's tight. That's at the end of the financial cycle. And every time the Fed tips us prematurely into recession in order to prevent inflation from taking off, they also prevent wage growth. And we've had three decades where we haven't seen much wage growth. I think, uh, frankly, Bullard's got a point. They ought to wait and see. They just don't know well enough what they're doing to be preemptive. And on the flip side, if they're wrong and we get a little bit of inflation, well, they can tighten then, and in the meantime, we'll get some wage growth to go with it, which would not be a bad thing at all. It's been 30 years since we've had significant wage growth. Wage growth, by the way, right now, and I didn't put this slide in, but if you look at average hourly earnings, it is the fastest it's been in about seven years. There are others at the Fed. Uh, Mr. Lacker, for example, from Richmond, uh, is, is worried we're going to see an, a spike in inflation any day now, he says, uh, because of that acceleration in wage growth. Board had another slide he showed us at the New York Forecasters Club where he's got the path of wages going back to the 70s, and he's got a green line, the range consistent with 2% inflation historically. We're in the bottom of that green zone right now. There is plenty of room for wages to accelerate without inflation. So, uh, in summary, growth in 2017 will be affected more by the things that already existed, the trends that were already underway in the economy than by Trump. Uh, you know, the Trump tax cuts, if we get them at all, will be a next year thing, not a this year thing. Even the biggest regulatory changes, we will likely have to wait a year or so. But in the meantime, this recovery was sandbagged by the oil recession two years ago. We are recovering from that now. We're going to get slightly faster growth in 2017 anyway. It's already picking up. Uh, I think 2.5% growth this year, 3% growth next year. Inflation will be tamed throughout. Uh, we are, to some extent, benefiting from the misfortunes of others. And what I mean by that is very slow growth outside the United States is keeping inflation pressures down. The fact, for example, that China's demand for oil has abated dramatically from where it was uh, 10 years ago is the reason we don't have to worry about $150 a barrel oil the way we did in 08. Productivity is our biggest economic challenge. From productivity growth comes all increases in the standard of living. From productivity growth comes the ability to grow GDP and income at a faster rate. Productivity growth right now is the slowest since the early 80s. I think it will accelerate if we can pare back some regulations. I think it will accelerate as millennials become more adept. Uh, you know, if you think about where labor force growth is right now, it is particularly young people. They will become more productive as they age and learn skills. And by the way, lest we feel self-important because our productivity is better than millennials, the prior low in productivity back in the early 80s was when boomers were young and coming into the workforce. We all have to learn. <laughs> the Federal Reserve is the biggest growth risk this year. They're convinced they can raise rates three times. If they do, I think it's going to be really challenging to grow the economy. Households in particular, uh, they're paying a higher rate of interest than they did in 2006, which seems strange, right, when you think about it, because rates are much lower. But the reason is it's, it's what they're borrowing. In 06, 90% of consumer debt was mortgage debt. 
which is secured by a big asset and therefore has a lower rate. Right now, most credit creation is credit cards unsecured, student loans unsecured, and car loans, where they are secured but at a higher rate. So I think we're a little more sensitive if the Fed decides it wants to raise rates, we're going to feel it. So in the end, though, I think cooler heads will prevail. When uh, I'm part of a group that met with Janet Yellen and the Fed board just a few weeks after the election, uh, Yellen was, well, I mean, we, we all know what Donald Trump said about Janet Yellen. <laughs> uh, the neat thing about Janet Yellen is that she could care less. Her goal is to get rates right, to get the economy right, and she's very much still focused on that goal. I think the Fed will get it right this year. And as a result, I think we're going to, at the end of this year, we will have enjoyed an acceleration in growth, and we will still have relatively low interest rates, with the Fed raising rates no more than twice. Any questions?